Welcome to Kim's Creations and this very special Poor Remembrance Day collaboration in honor of Remembrance Day. I am using an oval canvas that is 14 inches by 11 inches and I'm going to get it all prepped using these three colors which are Liquitex Basics in white and then I have um, Arteza in sap green and my blue is Amsterdam Prussian Blue Thalo. While I'm putting this together, I want to take an opportunity to just give a huge thank you to Nathan Linzel for putting together this epic Remembrance Day collaboration. There are artists from all around the world who are participating in this event and today is just day one and I am the first day's caboose. So um, I want to thank Tony Pender from the Hippy Dippy Painter Man for passing you all on to me and um, tomorrow I will post at the very end of my video, the link for Heather Aldo at Heather Lee Artistry. For this collaboration, the one thing we all had to do or have in common was camouflage. And as you see here, I have these five colors that I painstakingly mixed up to match the camouflage that I was using. This camouflage is the current official camouflage pattern for the Army, for the British Army, and it is the MTP, or the Multi-Terrain Pattern um, Camouflage, and it was established in March 2010 and is used currently. In my hands, I'm mixing up a darker brown, and the darker brown represents kind of the origins of camouflage. So again, I am looking specifically towards the um, British military and their actions and defense of freedom during World War I, the war to end all wars, or the Great War. So um, the British Tommy, as they were affectionately known, were really um, wearing the first camouflage uniforms. So in 1914 through to 1940, 19, sorry, 18, uh, they were army soldiers who were in the trenches in Europe. Before this time, and actually during this time, the regular British army was, you know, the Paul Revere, the Redcoats are coming, right? So they had a red and white uniform. Well, it, it's kind of surprising that they didn't realize before World War I how much red and white really stands out uh, in the terrain and it makes for an easy target to shoot at. So uh, this is where army uniforms really transitioned and the British Army stepped up and decided to change their uniform and um, the red coats or tunics and the white trousers were no longer used for those who were actually fighting in those trenches. And the newly designed khaki wool uh, uniforms, which um, were jackets with four large pockets. They had uh, a stand-up collar to kind of protect against the, the cold and anything else flying through the air. They had brass buttons and their uh, trousers or pants were more loose fitting to allow for better maneuverability. And they also had utility belts where they could hang all their stuff. You know, the pouches for food and water and ammo and anything else uh, that they might need to carry with them for personal survival. So I'm gonna show you some pictures of these um, Tommy's out in the field as well as what their uniform looked like right now. Also during this time, about this time, um, the Brody helmet was also developed and in 1915 the helmet uh, became a big uh, symbol of the British Tommy's. 
and it also replaced the soft caps that were worn before and again is what led to changes in military uniforms and you know tools that they were using across the world having a helmet that is made of steel and has a thick band helps to protect your face um, against shrapnel and anything else that might be flying through the air so you know these uniforms were designed to camouflage help protect the soldiers and um, allow for better survivability now in the case of the british tommy it the uniform also helped and became helped to unify and consolidate and um, became a symbol of allegiance and national identity and guess what these uniforms were called battle dress uniform bdus we still use this term today and so this history of how the Tommies got their new uniforms, the change from the bright red to something that's more camouflaged, um, was really the impetus for worldwide changes to military um, battle dress uniforms. And the Brody helmet was definitely a changer. Uh, most of the world's nations and their military armies have steel helmets and a camouflage uniform suited towards the terrain of the nations from around the world as well as the terrain that they might encounter themselves in nowadays. So that's the origin of camouflage, which I found to be very interesting. Now back to my piece. I have to say I'm pretty impressed with my camo. I think it turned out pretty darn close to the camo I was basing it off of. What do you guys think? What my piece is inspired by is not only World War I and the evolution of the British uniform and camouflage, but also the fields that they were fighting in and I wanted to incorporate poppies. Poppies really became a symbol of freedom and you know freedom from oppression because of World War I, because of this great war. And so the brown not only represents the Tommy uniform and the camo for current uniform, uh, of the British Army, but it all also represents just the trenches that the Tommies were fighting in, and the green will be the field of poppies, um, and that's going to lead into Flanders Field and that famous poem, which I will recite and tell you more about. Uh, in a little bit but that is my vision for this piece so just the trenches the military the bravery of all the soldiers past and present to help protect the world against oppression and aggression and the poppies you know again a symbol of love uh, a symbol of those who have been lost and the just the sacrifices that are made by some amazing people in our military who are willing to stand up and give their lives for freedom. All right, so I'm gonna let you guys sit back and watch this process just a little more. I tried to um, have the pencil transfer from the poppies onto the canvas, but the pencil that I was using was not uh, soft enough, so I ended up cutting each poppy out and then tracing around it just with a gel pen in green. Now I have my poppies all in place where I want them. Now I'm going to start filling in my poppies using that 
um, filler. And I've got a little bit of water there and um, I've got a cup with a piping bag that I'm just gonna put that all-purpose filler into and use it to outline and form my poppies. So again, I did mix some white into that. And um, <clears throat> this whole idea is inspired by AB Creative and I will link her channel below. She's done lots of 2D art with different flowers and has used this technique. She's used it with all-purpose filler as well as other products. It was a little challenging at first, but then I got the hang of it. Initially, I started drawing on, painting on, I guess, the petals that are behind in the flower before moving to the petals that are in front as that just helps to create a better 3D effect. I've slowed this portion down. You can see where I have the bead of the filler down and then I use a brush that I have wet with water and brushed off one side and I'm using that to just pull some of that filler down to fill in the petals. Here's my piece as it stands and my poppies are formed and dried. Now I need to decide what red I'm gonna use and I ended up using Folk Art Raspberry Flash, the asterisked ones, Arteza Carmine Red, and Arteza Vermilion Red. I'm just gonna put some on um, this palette so that I can then start coloring in my poppies. How did poppies become a symbol, a worldwide symbol, for World War I and Remembrance Day. Well, it all started with Lieutenant Colonel John McRae, who was a Canadian who served as a brigade surgeon for an allied artillery unit. And in the spring, shortly after the Second Battle of Ypres in the Flanders region, which covers northern France and southern Belgium, he noticed that, you know, in amongst the completely turned over and wrecked land that was there, poppies were growing and red blossoms were everywhere. And he unfortunately had to bury a good friend of his, Lieutenant Alex Helmer, um, who was amongst the dead. Some 80,000 Allied soldiers were killed, wounded, or missing in battle. And struck by the sight of the bright red poppies, which are actually classified as weeds, <laughs> go figure, um, he wrote the poem in Flanders Field. Now this poem in, that was first published in 1915, um, he was actually encouraged to, to publish it at that time and it turned into this amazing work of art and uh, was spread far and wide and he did get to see it become this great thing. Uh, before his own death in 1918. So from there, uh, a woman in the United States, Moyna Michael, uh, read this poem in Flanders Field just two days before the armistice. And she really wanted to spread the word and she wrote her own poem called We Shall Keep the Faith but um, she also really wanted to spread the poppy as a symbol of, you know, World War I. 
and she vowed to always wear one. So she started creating the first batches of this bloom with her colleagues, and after the war ended, uh, she came up with the idea of selling silk poppies to raise money to support returning veterans. She managed, in the mid-20s, the Georgia branch of the American Legion, and she got them to adopt the poppy as its symbol. And after that, the, Nor the National American Legion voted to use the poppy as the official U.S. National Emblem of Remembrance, and that was in September of 1920. Meanwhile, over in France, a lady by the name of Angela Guerin was also championing the poppy. She organized women, children, as well as veterans to help make artificial poppies and the donations or the money raised from selling them went towards restoring France. So between the two campaigns, the Remembrance Poppy has really grown in its symbol throughout the British Commonwealth and other allied nations. In England, in November of 1921, the newly founded Royal British Legion had its first ever poppy appeal where it raised 106,000 pounds and that money went towards employment as well as housing for the Great War veteran. Shortly after this, other nations around the world started churning out poppies as their official symbol of Remembrance Day. And nowadays, you know, almost 100 years later, people in the UK, Canada, France, Belgium, Australia, New Zealand, wear the poppies on November 11th. November 11th is recognized as Remembrance Day or Armistice Day, as in 1918, the armistice was signed on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month and marked the end of World War I. While that was happening around the world, in the U.S., things developed a little bit differently and November 11th is known as Veterans Day, which honors living veterans and the poppies are not worn at this time. However, on the last Monday in May, the U.S. celebrates Memorial Day, which commemorates soldiers who have given their lives in service of freedom. And at that time, we might see more people wearing the poppies. In conclusion, I'd like to read In Flanders Fields by John McRae. In Flanders Fields, the poppies blow between the crosses, row on row, that mark our place. And in the sky, the larks still bravely singing fly, scarce heard amongst the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago, we lived felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you from falling hands we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders fields. Thank you all for being a part of this Poor Emberance collaboration. And if you're not subscribed, please like, share, and subscribe. This concludes day one, but please come back tomorrow, November the 10th at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for Heather Aldo at Heather Lee Artistry. See you then.